Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Greg, the single guy, and Matt, the family guy. We're recording episodes from around the globe to tell you about the best kept secret in education. That's right, it's teaching overseas. We're glad to have you. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, international teachers, would be international teachers, family, friends, potential sponsors. I would like to welcome you to episode number four of International Teacher Podcast. This is expat Matt, and I am with my co-host, the single guy, Greg. Greg, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm just doing great. I can't wait to do this episode, Matt. This is going to be fun. Greg, we have uh, received an overwhelming amount of positive, positive feedback for the podcast so far. So that's been pretty exciting. What is the probably the strangest thing you've heard related to our podcast since we started this. Well, my mom hasn't called me or talked to me since we did our last one. I think I said something wrong. What do you think, Matt? <laughs> yeah, I think you're in the, you're probably in the doghouse. Yeah, probably uh, in the doghouse. It's, it's usually a short-lived stay, I think. I, Greg, I think the coolest part has just been people randomly stopping me in the hall going, hey, and they'll throw something out from the podcast. And I'm like, oh my God, you actually listened. Right. People really are listening, aren't they? Yeah, the coolest is that people are reaching out. Um, people that I haven't talked to in a long time. I know that Noah and uh, his wife are in China, and I haven't seen them in forever. But they just chimed in with a, you know, Facebook or something like that. They're coming out of the woodwork, Matt. Yeah. Well, we just want to remind everybody too: if you have uh, ideas about future shows, if you have questions, complaints. The complaints can be addressed to Greg, obviously. Uh, otherwise, you can hit us up at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. And for those of you that are all over the social media scene, we are also at ITP Expats on Instagram as well. When we get more to say, I'm sure we'll fire up Twitter too. We are officially on Instagram. What kind of pictures are you putting up there? The photo of uh, you and me in Nassau with you and your swim thing and me and my uh, bright orange fleet farm hat. Oh, that went that with, with our last thing. episode. That's right. You brought that yes. up. Oh, fantastic. I thought we it looked, looked good. Yeah. I thought it was the way to go. Yeah, well, absolutely. We look good, Matt. Yeah, not going to lie. So uh, as we kick into episode number four, we thought it would be important to talk a little bit today about why people would want to consider going overseas. What are some of the things we considered And then also, what are some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks even of going overseas too? Maybe some things that people need to keep in mind that they hadn't necessarily thought of. Because I got a question for you. Go ahead. You and I come from two different kind of journeys on the international scene. To begin with, what were your primary motivations for wanting to go overseas? I think the most important part for me was just even hearing about traveling and teaching. You know, I heard about that at a cocktail party and and I just I jumped at it I mean there was no looking back the minute I found out about it the minute I got to the job fair I knew I was going to walk away with a job and I was going to teach overseas I wasn't going to stay because I was feeling homebound at the time you know I just finished up another four years or three and a half years of college and then when I graduated I was I was gone boom see I never looked back so that was my biggest motivation I'm a traveler I know that the the most important part is the career teaching but with this, you can focus on teaching, but your other focus can be travel if that's the way you want to do it. Not the other way around, really. It's not just a travel sure. pass. How about you, Matt? What, what got you into it? Uh, honestly, when I was look, considering over going overseas teaching, you know, at, at the time, Stacy, who was my girlfriend, had suggested we just try teaching overseas. Again, I was burned out. I was ready to quit teaching altogether. And so for me, it was just to try something new. Did I not realize how, how much my doors were about to get blown off? So when we started this out, my prime motivation was, yeah, well, rather than quit, let's just try it and see what happens. And that is what got us started on the journey. So you just wanted to change. Like, I bet you there's a lot of, of teachers out there in the States, especially younger ones that may not be married, or even if some that are married with a, a wife and children, but are feeling sort of fenced in with their job. Maybe they, I have a friend that's been at the same job ever since I've been overseas. She's been at the same building for 20 years, Matt. Same school, Ooh. same district, same job. I can't remember some of my places that I've been as far as buildings and, and rooms, unless I sat down and really thought about it. How about you, Matt? Yeah. 
Uh, you know, I could really empathize with your friend, you know, when I was teaching in Minnesota back in the Woodhood, but I was in year nine and I was basically, I kind of felt, you know what a Vegas performer might feel like? Where they're Absolutely just doing the not. Same thing day after day after day and year after year. And I, it got, it kind of got to that point. Don't get me wrong. It was an amazing school and I had amazing coworkers. Like Groundhog Day. Yes, at that point, it just felt like, am I really going to do this again? Like it was the same school, the same classroom, the same classes, the same content. And it just was a repetition I couldn't deal with. So I know exactly what your friend was going through, but not at 20 years. How can people do that, Matt? I really don't understand. There's a lot of teachers out there. And if they want to change, if they can do it, I mean, because you and I can talk about this at some point, there's a lot going into leaving. I mean, you left your house, you left your family, you left a lot of things, but the motivation was to get a change in your both of your lives and try it out, right? From what I can understand you saying. Yeah, professional change. You know, I was fairly content with all the other aspects of my life, but professionally, I just was ready for something different and ready for something new. I, yeah, I, I was not prepared for what lay ahead of me, that's for sure. And I guess, I, Greg, I guess one thing to think about, too, is there's there's some people out there who were maybe in your case who were feeling pent up and were feeling like, man, the walls are closing in. I got to get out of here. It's like the Star Wars trash compactor scene and Luke and Han and Leia are in there and the walls are closing around them. And yeah, I get that, too. Maybe there's other people that are thinking, geez, I don't know if I can go overseas. I don't know if this is for me. Oh, they're missing out on so much. Well, they are. But I also, you know, I guess coming from a small town in southern Minnesota, I mean, if I can make the jump to do this and adjust, I think just about anybody could do this. You know, before we'd gone overseas, I'd never even been to Florida before. That's a good point, and I like that for our listeners because there's two different viewpoints completely. You you were one of those guys that never left your roots, and I'm one of those people that never had roots, really. Mine were traveling all the time, I mean, over the years and family and stuff like that. But for you, growing up in the same area, and that was there's a big difference in leaving home for you and leaving what I consider home at the time for me. So that's a great point, man. You know, when you say you didn't have roots, you did. It's just yours are a different kind. Yeah. You know, it's a different a different way to establish yourself. Yeah, I have mobile roots, I guess you could say. I'm setting you up here, Matt. What's the primary benefit of being overseas as a teacher? Well, I've I've got several things that are definitely on my list, but I guess first of all, I kind of have to retroactively answer this because 13 years ago, I would not, my, my would not have been able to answer this. My answer would have been entirely different. And so this is after reflecting over 13 years. These are just some of the things that I found to be benefits. Uh, number one, I would say financial reasons is a huge one. Um, I know how a lot of teachers work in the U.S. or in a lot of professions and you struggle to make ends meet. You know, they tell you in college that teachers do not make a lot of money. And once you get into the professional world, you see exactly how true that is. And I know there's I won't get into, you know, pay with different jobs and things like that. But it's definitely challenging. And I would have to say one of the perks of going overseas is financial. And just in terms of not every country you go to is going to have schools that are going to pay you a lot. So, for example, if, if you're working in Mexico, if you're working in Latin America, and if you're working in certain areas of South America, you're not going to get paid as much. But when you think about the finances of it, there's also cost of living differences as well. Let's say, for example, if you I don't know. You get a job in Mexico City of all places. You know, we have friends that te we have good friends that teach there. And I would imagine um, I don't know what they pay there, but I'm guessing knowing this couple, I'm guessing they're still able to save quite a bit of money because of how you live, the, ch the lifestyle choices you make. Um, you can live as luxurious or as non-luxurious as you want. And I don't know that I've talked to anybody who's worked overseas who wasn't able to save money. And you know that goes for the fact that you're married, so there you're both you're both certified teachers. So where you're coming from and where I'm coming from speaks to both because there really are a lot like us. There's a lot of single teachers, there's a lot of married couples with children, there's married people without, and there's also a few, I'd say a few single parents, not many. It's very hard to get hired if you have children and you're on your own. 
But it depends on the school, sure. of course, depends on the situation. I like what you're saying there because my first place was Honduras, and this was almost sure. 20 years ago. I got hired. I was making about 12000 a year. But I had a maid. I had a car. I went traveling every weekend. I went diving once a month in the Caribbean. And I ate like a king. So I really didn't need anything. I was in the black, meaning I had paid off all my, my student loans after the first you know two or three years. I was in the black. And I had sure. friends that were doing the same thing, Matt. They were saving money even at a low-income school compared to living in the States, because all those things add up, the housing and all those things add up. Oh, absolutely. As you say, a lot of the job packages that you get along with your paycheck, housing is typically included, or there's some places that will give you a housing stipend where then you can go out and choose accommodations that fit your needs and your lifestyle that you want to live. Yes. Usually those are comparative to your school that you're at in the country you're in. For example, in Cambodia, when I lived there, they'd give you about $500, $600 a month. And that was enough to get you at least halfway into an, a nice place or an affordable place near school. Yeah, absolutely. And you also bring up the point about all of the support that you can get in terms of, you, you know, you typically, we had a maid as well. And then you've also got people that wash your car and some people even have gardeners and things like that. It is a little bit of a different kind of a lifestyle. And okay, you may be teaching somewhere and not making a ton, but you can still typically afford to have all of these people employed as well. And you're taking care of them and their families. You know, it's amazing how far you can stretch your salary. You can stretch your dollar as well. We have to keep in mind that this is not every school, but it's been our experiences. One point I do want to make is that when you're in Europe, th this is not going to be the case. There's not going to be a way to really afford a maid and a driver and stuff like that in Europe. And it's it's a cost-benefit analysis. It's what you're earning versus the cost of living versus the quality of life. Because in most sure. European countries, the quality of life is so high that if you were to hire a maid, it'd be even more expensive than in the States. They have so many different rules there. and Yeah, that's a good point. And you've also, along with different countries and different paychecks, there's also, again, the lifestyles. You can live like a, a king or queen in certain places and like a pauper in others. And you're going to have some places where you might make a lot of money, but there may not be a lot to do. And then you're going to be in places like in Europe where you were, and you're going to have so many different things and experiences you can can check out. But let's just face it, you're not going to be moving to Geneva, driving an Audi, and living in a flat in downtown, living on an international teacher salary. Since we're talking about money a little bit, Matt, tell me, without even really going into our school here, but your lifestyle right now as a parent, you have sure. four kids. And you yes, and your wife, you and Stacy, both work. But yeah, how how does that work with uh, your maid slash nanny slash babysitter slash everything else? She lives with you, right? Yeah, yeah, she's lived with us and been with us for going on five years. So we consider her more family than we we uh, definitely delineate. Yeah, okay, she might be the nanny who helps take care of the boys, but she's become family as well. And, you know, it was funny. I was talking to my grandma the other night. And of course, my grandma wants to know how she is. She doesn't ask how I'm doing. But she's like, so tell me how so and so is. I, sorry, I don't want to say fine. her name to protect her anonymity. Yeah, but uh, yeah, um, so she definitely watches over the boys. She makes sure they get to school. She makes sure they get fed. Um, she's kind of she does everything. So uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have her uh, helping and supporting our family. Also, we have a gardener. You don't do laundry. You don't do, no, you no. don't cook unless you want to. You have a maid that she's living in with you. She takes care of your kids. This is very normal for overseas in many places, not every place, but many places right. that I've been, it's very normal for that. And it saves a marriage for, according to some of my friends. It really does. It takes a lot of those extra things that you have to worry about out of the equation. Of course, you're paying for it, but you also are because su you're supporting sure. her enough to send her home and you give her enough money that she's saving stuff too, right? Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, I actually, when we initially interviewed her, we were like, yes, you know, we want to hire her and bring, bring her over to work. She's from the Philippines, by the way. So if uh, you're from the Philippines and you're hearing this, hello, everybody. I was hesitant to hire her because she had four kids also. And I was like, my goodness, I can't, 
I can't take her away from her four kids. And one of my friends pulled me aside who had previously had a nanny. He said, no, no, you're not thinking about this the right way. He said, by you hiring her, you're also supporting her and her fa- helping support her family as well. So you might be giving her a paycheck, but a lot of that money is going to go back home, like, for example, to the Philippines. And that's going to do a lot of good there, or at least we hope it does. So, yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to to know that it's going to help out other family members as well. I remember we had in Honduras, we had usually it was a female maid that would come in. And then in Egypt, it was mainly men. So we had a guy from Nigeria and we had to actually let him go because the the first guy we had was stealing jewelry from my buddy who was selling jewelry. Sure. Left it out one day and just gave the wrong opportunity. Anyway, the point is that depending on where you live in what country and what the norm is, right? Having a live-in maid or nanny or driver or gardener or any kind of helper, it's a symbiotic relationship because you take care of them and help protect them from certain things in the country that you're living in and support them. And they send the money back home. And I remember in Honduras, we would even send our, our nanny would go home every Sunday so she could see her family. We'd drive her two hours to her house right at the base of the mountain. She'd jump on a bus and go up and we even paid for like English lessons for her. And and she was amazing, Matt. I mean, I remember one summer, one summer we were gone. We, meaning my friends and I, they had the apartment. We shared our nanny and she was so bored during the summer while everybody was gone that she, she was starting to clean everything like the basketball. I think she cleaned, uh, she cleaned my buddy's (laughs) shoes. My buddy had these painting (laughs) shoes. Yes. I mean, they, they find so many things to do. I mean, like you could bounce a quarter off my bed every morning. You know, this woman would iron my underwear. I mean, I never asked her to, it was just part of the thing that she did. That was her, her thing. And you get used to it. You, I mean, when you go home, do you like wonder where your, where the maid is? Right, where's the nanny? Is she, oh, we didn't bring her this summer. <laughs> not, not quite that bad. Not, and yeah, we've actually brought her back with us to the States in the summer times too. Anyway, we're, we're kind of going way off the track here on this one, but definitely there's financial reasons that are enough. You know, you can save anywhere in some places 5% of your salary on up to 75% of your salary. And then maybe there's people that do even more than that. If you're careful about how you live, and reasonable about it, you can definitely save money, which is a huge bonus. I was going to say, if you are looking into this, though, this is obviously part of the homework. You know, when you're talking to schools, you definitely want to be asking about pay packages and things like that. And obviously, that's maybe not the first thing you bring up, but you maybe you start with questions about the school in general. But eventually, you need to have that conversation. And if it's a school that isn't willing to have that conversation or is somewhat guarded about it, I'd be, uh, I'd be careful. And it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you can save at the end of the month. Right, Matt? Yes, totally. Absolutely. For example, where we live, it's it's $10 for a pound of hamburger and $10 for a box of Raisin Bran. So that gives you an idea of we uh, we do okay in terms of salary. But when you're paying $10 for hamburger, that's uh, that's a lot. Love going to Walmart. I think we're going to have to do a whole episode just on money, and we could do several episodes on money from all different aspects, right? Yes, absolutely. Let's hear one of your reasons for going overseas. Mine was One of mine was financial. Now, looking back on it, how about you? Looking back on it, mine stays the same. Even from the beginning, I wanted to go overseas because I did not think that teachers were respected in the States. All of my friends that were going into teaching that were in teaching already, it was not just financially disrespectful, meaning that a plumber might make more money, but they were always complaining about not having respect from parents. And since I've left in every country that I've been to and teachers I've talked to, with very few exceptions, I have always had the respect of parents and students. It's a very high level job in many countries and cultures. So that's one reason I left. I would have to totally agree with you on on all counts there. Yeah, absolutely. You are treated like an entirely different person once you go overseas versus where you are at home. And also, I feel like your professional environment is different in terms of, I feel like you're treated maybe a little bit more differently by admin. And I I don't mean by like principals, but I mean like some of the higher ups because it's a much smaller environment and you're not just a number. And so you're more professionally valuable to that organization. They need you there. Usually I feel like 
the admin that we've been able to deal with have done a nice job of taking care of us as we've been overseas. And once again, it depends on the school you're at. But of course, you said there's it's a smaller environment. The schools that I've been at, it's it's really funny because when I was in the states and I was before I was teaching, I was doing a pre service job and then student teaching. And I remember to this day, I was student teaching one day, and I went into the lunch room or the you know the teacher war room, and and uh, everyone's really quiet and flustered, and everyone's chatting. I'm like, what's going on? And they're like. Be careful. The superintendent's going to be coming to our building this week sometime. And I was like, what's going on? You know, it's like, then yeah. you know this for a fact, Matt. We used to go out with our superintendent on his boat and and have a little happy hour as, and a booze cruise as we were going around with some of our colleagues. You know, we'd, every once in a while you'd go out or have dinner at the superintendent's house. We know our superintendents pretty well. I mean, not every school. Overseas, you get to know who your superintendent is just as well as your principal's. And it's not something that's far, you're not just part of a huge district most of the time. You're part of a school system that's run that run by a superintendent that might have been in charge of a whole district in the States, like in New York or in, in you know whatever state. But they come overseas and they're in charge of one school because they're they're in charge of the the politics, the face of that school as well as running it. They have to deal with all the parents and the politics, right? So it's a smaller environment. Yeah, when you move into these, well, obviously you're moving into this little enclave of of people that you're going to be working with, living around. So they do kind of become your default or de facto family. And, uh, you know, in most, most cases, I think a lot of people have tight knit groups and things like that. But yeah, it's like a new family member that you're bringing in or new family members. Let's move on here. I have another option for you. I think another one on your list would be travel, and I know that's on the top of my list. Can you talk a little bit about the motivation or just part of how travel keeps you overseas? Well, uh, number one, you know, for example, let's let's give people an idea what it was like in Venezuela uh, traveling. So Veni was a, a intense place to live. And so for this guy who'd never even been to Florida before, you know, travel, yeah, you know, I was just excited to check out some new places. And when we were in Venezuela, due to certain government uh, restrictions or poor relations between the U.S. and the Venezuelan government, I won't go into those reasons right now, um, we weren't able to acquire actual work visas. And so we were technically there working on a tourist visa. I forgot well, about that. Ben, <laughs> a U.S. T- this I just loved this because this was amazing. The whole thing. I remember I, at the end of our first three months, our ninety days was up, and our our boss was like, "Okay, listen, you got to get out of the country." Not we weren't in trouble or anything, but we had to leave Venezuela for at least forty eight hours to renew our tourist passport. And we're like, "Okay, what does that mean?" And I forget what they gave us. Was it like fifteen hundred bucks each? Something, or like, something that. like that. Yeah, it was this, to me, which was an astronomical amount of money. It was like you're going to give us three grand to, and we just have to go. I think on our first trip, our first repat trip, they gave us three grand to go to Miami for a week. And so I was like, I'm finally going to get to check Florida out. Because honestly, at the end of that 90 days, you're just so tired of no electricity and no water. You just want to get the heck out of there. It doesn't matter where you go. And but yeah, we had so we were given money to leave. And this was the first, dare I say, four years of the job for me. So in the summer after my fourth year. They were like, okay, your, your work visa is prepared. And I was like, no, I'm losing out on travel money. So for three years, we were getting paid to go on cruises. We were going to pay, getting paid to go scuba diving. Every country is not like this. You won't be working semi-illegally. I was like you. I didn't understand. You mean I'm, I have to leave to renew my visa, which is a normal thing in, some, in countries, especially when you first arrive. I'll, I'll attest yeah. to that, Matt. There's other countries where you do have to go in as a tourist and you work a tour while they're working on your paperwork in country and you know, as they're getting your work visa yeah. made that's very normal but like you said for four years straight you know they never figured it out down there but that country was a little backwards with its uh, red tape and with its regulations yeah, and things so sure. i remember i now that you say that i do remember i think i went to trinidad my first time i could be wrong but they paid us to leave you to are. go back yeah you, you, yeah yeah I think Trinidad was Christmas for you, actually. Your first trip out was when you and I went back to Minnesota. Remember on that really bumpy plane ride? Oh, I thought we were yes. going to die. 
That's right. The early days <laughs> of Matt get, traveling. That's right. Trapped in a snowstorm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so where have you traveled since you've been overseas, Matt? Can you list off some of your favorites? Or Sure, sure. Some of my favorites was a place called Bocas del Toro, Panama, uh, which you were involved in. That was a week of scuba diving and surfing. If you've never been to Panama, you definitely have to check Panama out. An amazing place. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, the Galapagos Islands. We went and did a liveaboard for a week in the Galapagos and sailed from island to island each night. It was amazing. We slept like crap because the boat was really bumpy, but you'd wake up on a new island every morning. If you haven't seen the Galapagos, it's really hard to explain. Like if you've seen videos of it, that's exactly what it's like when you get there. I, I don't know. I've seen things on TV and I'm like, what the heck? This isn't anything like the video. And you get to the Galapagos and it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, this is just like the video. I think I saw this same marine iguana, and here I am snorkeling next to it. Uh, Galapagos was pretty sweet, and uh, obviously you heard me talk about the Maldives. I've been to the Maldives five times with my family. Absolutely love the Maldives. Those are just some of the highlights of places we've gone to. But otherwise, we've been all over the Caribbean, and we've started to venture into Europe a little bit too. Uh, obviously, we've traveled around the Middle East, which has been pretty cool as well. But there's still a laundry list of places we want to get out and go see. Uh, like, for example, I really want to check out Singapore. Uh, I've always been kind of enthralled with, with that city. I definitely want to check it out. You know, I've had to go through Amsterdam's airport so many times. I've never actually had a chance to go through Amsterdam. So one of these days, I kind of want to be able to just walk out the front door and go hang out in Amsterdam for, I don't know, several hours or maybe a couple days. I want to do the same thing with Korea because I've been through the Korean airport several times and they have German beer in the airport, which is great. One of my, you know, fascinations, but I never got a chance to go outside of Korea. At some point, I do want to see it. We both have traveled a lot, and no matter what, it's like your passport takes the place of your driver's license. I don't know about you, but I, I memorized my passport number a long time ago. Going through so many different customs, so many different country borders, taking so many different airplanes, which I'm so surprised after all these years, you still are going on airplanes. I love it, Matt. I remember that first time we did go home back to the States and you were just yeah. clutching at everything as we're taking off. You're doing oh, a great gosh. job. That's a lot of travel you've done. Are your kids traveling with you to a lot of these places now? or? Yeah, they've traveled everywhere. For example, my oldest, Ruru, he's got his own Sky Miles account with Delta that we've had since he was one. You know, just things like that. So like, for example, in December, when we got out of here and flew to the Maldives, the boys are just as comfortable in an airport as they are at the house. Like we went back to the airport here and they knew exactly where to go. You know, they've each got their own little carry on tote bag with them and they go marching through the airport holding their iPads and don't judge us. We're iPad parents when we travel. It's uh, a blast to be able to take the kids along with us as well. The boys are talking a lot about they want to check out maybe Greece because of all the history there. So that might be our, one of our next destinations we have to check out. Well, that's the whole joy of living overseas is that we are we have access to the world. And I think that that is one of the best perks about living overseas and teaching as an overseas teacher. But I tell you what, the other thing that I love a lot about it is it, the travel is, is the culture and the language, right? Let's focus on language oh, for, for sure. a second. Yes. What I like a lot about is is the language, Matt what some people think is that we teach in different languages or when you go overseas, you have to learn a language as an overseas teacher. But you and I both know that most of the international schools, the accredited ones, they, the lingua franca, the main language that we live and teach in is English, but we live in other countries. So you can learn another language depending on how long you stay there. Right? Like Venezuela yeah. for you. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about language there. When you go overseas, you're going to meet several different kinds of, kinds of people. You're going to have people that are going to go live somewhere. They'll be there for maybe a year or two, maybe three, four, whatever. And they won't know a lick of any of the local language. Okay. And then you got people that are going to roll up in there. They're hardcore. They want to learn it. They want to, you know, just, they want this place to envelop them and make, you know, make them a different person. And so they're going to be studying the language and things like that. And then you're probably going to have people that are more like me who started with colors, numbers, and swear words. And you know what? There's not a wrong way to do it. You know, if you're not interested in learning the language, that's okay. And if you really want to learn the language to immerse yourself, that's okay. And if you really want to make a cab driver laugh at your knowledge of colors and swear words, that's okay too. And so to each their own with that one. 
but it was tremendously terrifying to go to Venezuela for the first time. Obviously, I knew what Spanish is, and I took it in high school and college and things like that. But until you're immersed in a room full of people that cannot speak English and they look at you like, sorry, buddy, um, no hablo inglés, you, you know, then it's like, oh, crap, I'm not in Kansas anymore. I remember my first week in Venezuela, we went to a butcher shop and I was trying to order bacon. And in my worst Spanish, I was like, uh, tiene bacon, you know, pig, oink, oink. And the woman <laughs> started cussing <laughs> me out from behind the counter. Like, who's the, who brought the gringo to order bacon in my butcher shop? And then this guy next to me starts laughing and he's like, what, what do you need? He spoke to me in English. I was like, oh my gosh, you speak English. <laughs> I almost hugged him. I was like, I just want to order some bacon. And he starts laughing. He's like, okay, here's how you say it. And then we got in like an argument with the lady because he didn't pronounce it exactly. He's like tocineta, which is the word for bacon. And so I said that and she's like, que? Que dices? Like, what did you say? And I'm like, uh, tocineta. And she's like, no, tocineta. I was like, I said tocineta. She's like, no, tocineta. I was like, tocineta. She's like, no. Okay. And then she's like, just like, okay, fine. Let's get you out of here. I was like, so sometimes, you know, it can be terrifying, but if you just try it, I think a lot of other experiences, people have been like, okay, you're at least trying. So let's give this a shot. Yeah. We like the fact that you're giving our language a shot. Let me, let me piggyback on your story. I've got one from when, when I first learned Spanish, I had gotten down to Honduras and I didn't know any Spanish and Honduran Spanish is a little different than Venezuelan. We went out and played pool one night and we're it was later after after playing pool most of the evening. We went to, I think it was Hardee's. And yes, they have Hardee's and they have Wendy's and everything all over the world. So we go into right. this Hardee's and the four of us didn't really speak very much, but we were with one buddy, you know, you usually hang out with one buddy that speaks, that's either native in their language or just knows it really well. I get up there and start slurring my words. I'm speaking my gringo Spanish. I'm struggling with them like yo quiero numero uno <laughs> with fries you know something like that i'm trying sure. to find the right words to say and whatever i said i can't remember but i was probably the third one in line and after we all got up there and struggled with the spanish the guy turns around he goes yeah in english he goes yeah we need number three and number four and a number one without any ketchup you know <laughs> sure Guy was just smiling from ear to ear when that happened, but oh, what a great experience. Language is so fascinating, Matt. When you and I were in Venezuela, when Scotty got there, I mean, I think what's funny is that we, you and I had different levels of language because I had been in Honduras before, different right. language. Yeah. And you always, you know, loved learning new words. And I was a little bit more fluent than you because I was experimenting with the Way local ladies. Yeah. Way more. Then Scott comes along. Talk about fluency. You know, he just knew everything. It fit so perfectly with his life down there, right? And he yeah, showed up, it, the three of us, three separate levels, but the three sure. or four of us together, it's amazing because you have all different situations like you're talking about. The one that doesn't speak any Eng any Spanish or local language at all, that just speaks English with everybody. The person that loves yeah. a few key phrases like colors and swear words especially. And then there's this, the person that yes. struggles really hard to learn it. And then, of course, the person that shows up and just fits right in with all the language and the local sounds and stuff. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it just opens a lot of doors. You know, the one thing, I guess, looking back, I wish I would have known more Spanish uh, just because of the cool um, local Venezuelans who worked with us. Like, for example, the janitorial staff, those guys were awesome, but I never really, you know, I never really got a chance to talk with those guys a lot. Yeah, we had a different connection on that one. Yeah, for sure. I just it would have been really cool to get to know know them a lot more, but that just wasn't always the case. Yeah, I would. I, but you had a you had a family and a wife. I would go on on Friday nights after school and hang out with with the locals like every Friday night and sit around and passing certain things around and just talking in their language with the old guys driving the buses and stuff. And then that was a whole different experience. You're sitting around speaking their language, and there was no room for English because the old guys don't speak English. It was crazy. Yeah. But it's different every country. On your resume, you can label that as language acquisition libation. And I think that's an actual job skill. And you know what? And there's there's people, though, who don't take those opportunities as well that could. 
And, you know, yeah, you're right. I was married in total different circumstance and I didn't have those opportunities. Okay, let's let's think about this. So if you're a person who's going overseas, what is an experience that you've had where you were able to travel somewhere, but you were still able to connect with somebody in a new culture for some totally random reason, but it just made a memorable experience that you wouldn't have been able to, you probably wouldn't have had this chance if you were home in America. Oh, I've got this one. All right, I want to hear that. A few years back, I went to Sri Lanka. And I went on a dive trip. The connection that I made was not with the divers. The divers are from all different countries. And you know how that goes. You know, you're diving with people from all over the world. And it was a real small group. Yeah. And Sri Lanka has like four main religions, right? They have Buddhism. They have Islam. They have Christianity. And they have, let's say, three main religions, like I said. Anyway, (laughs) I made a connection with our... um, our boat captain, he was not part of the dive group. He was just hired as the guy that would drive the boat every day. So the dive right. center just hired him, and we started to connect just talking in the boat and on the way out there, and every, nobody else had talked to him, but I did. And he spoke English just fine, right? It was right around Christmas time, and we did a day-before-Christmas dive, and he said, what are you doing for Christmas? And I said, well, I was... You know, I'm just, I'm going to plan on diving. Are they going diving? He said, no, there's no dives on Christmas Day. And he said, how about if you come to my house? I would like to invite you to my house for Christmas. And I was, Lord. I said, absolutely, I would be honored. And uh, the first thing I did when I got back, called up my friend who lives down in the southern part of Sri Lanka, and I asked her, I said, what do I bring to a family that lives in the Barrios, like for Christmas? Because they're not they're right. not the upper echelon, they're not the top one percenters, they're really sure. poor. My friend said, definitely bring flour, sugar, uh, bring something for the kids like crayons or, or some paper for school, yeah. school supplies. And I it was like, wow, I'm going over to this guy's house. You know, I can't believe this. What am I going to do? And what's it going to be like for an experience? It's so hard to describe the feeling that I had. I was so welcomed. I stopped and got groceries for them. Like my friend said, I went and got like a couple cases of beer, sat there in this guy's like little garden area in the barrio. They had this little tin roof house and he had his yeah. two kids there and his wife. And we sat in the front in the front of his uh, little garden area for the entire afternoon while his wife was cooking. And that's just the way things happened, right? That's the way they did it. Sure. Every once in a while, I'd have to go to the bathroom in their little latrine because they didn't have any running water. Right. It was such an experience, but it made me feel like it was really Christmas. Here I was. We we had this beautiful little buffet of food. The two kids that didn't speak any English uh, his wife didn't speak any English, so he would translate for me, for his little kids and for his wife. And when they opened up their crayon sets, they started like drawing all over the walls, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. You know, in the kitchen, yeah. they had a white wall and the kids just started drawing on, even though I gave them paper. We had the most wonderful experience talking. And the next day we went out diving again. And he was on the boat. He was just smiling from ear to ear. It was the most wonderful experience. I wrote all about it in, in my newsletter. I haven't been able to, to get down sure. deep into it. But that was an experience that I would never be able to experience back at home, I don't think. Right? Maybe I could, but it was just so off the beaten path. Yeah, well, the randomness of it is what I think makes those opportunities so cool. Like, I never would have put this together. No way. I was never yeah. planned. So yeah. back at you. I know you got a couple stories. Tell me a story of a randomness or an experience that you want to share that you've experienced overseas. Okay. Well, one of the things, this is surprise, surprise. This has to do with sports. I'm a huge, huge believer that sports is something you transcend culture, race, religion, socioeconomics. Sports has a way of bringing people together. This was when we were in Venezuela. I got invited to join a like a softball team, like a fast pitch softball team there for one of the local churches, actually. I got a chance to meet this guy named Luis, who was a professional baseball player in the U.S., who spoke English, thank God, because nobody else on my team did. And I got invited to join this team, and it was funny. When they told all our bus drivers at school about it, they're like, he's going to go where? 
anyway, we had to go into this place called um, uh, Tronconal, which was one of the barrio. Tronconal numero seis. I was probably, okay, I was the first white person to probably ever go into Tronconal. Speaking with colors and... You were speaking like red, blue, and hello, oh, and, and then the, the swear languages. <laughs> yeah, going from where we lived in, you know, our little tourist enclave in Venezuela to the barrio Tronconal, I will never forget when the door opened and the blast of noise, uh, the smell of garbage at the side of the road. The Okay, it was the mix of reggaeton with old beer with... Dogs barking. It was just crazy. I was, yeah, was not prepared for it. Anyway, I was lucky enough to get invited to join this team and we go to this field and it's basically just a big sand lot with a baseball fence around it. But the stands are packed. There's probably 350 people at this. I'm like, if you get 10 people to come watch us play at home, that's one thing. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, there's like 350 people here. And they are all lit because it's a Sunday afternoon. You know, it's party time. Venezuelans are huge baseball fans and they love watching their games. So we come in, I get introduced to this team and they're thinking the only Americans that tend to be in Venezuela are oil company guys or professional baseball players. Pretty much it. And so they're like, oh, you brought this guy. He must be a former professional or something. If anybody's ever seen me play, they would know that is obviously not the case. The game started and they had me hit first lead off very first pitch of the game. I hit the ball out of the park. You hit a home run? I hit a, I just hit a tank, just a bomb over the wall. And my team, the stance went batshit crazy. Like beer and whiskey flying into the, the air. The gringo knows how had, to play. <laughs> they had a siren, like the announcer has this siren thing. And like I had walk-up music and stuff. And all of a sudden there's a siren going off. And my team is like chasing me down the first baseline. People went crazy. I'm pretty sure there was a parade held in my honor. There might even be a couple kids in, in Tronco now named after me after just from that moment. Um, and I was automatically, I was in on the team from that point on. And I actually, um, just from that game, all the people that were there, like I came out, people are coming into the dugout, like getting pictures taken with me. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like I just hit a, can we go back to something here? You've said, and I yeah. don't know as much as you do about sports. I'm sure a lot of our listeners know sports, and baseball sure, is, yeah. is your thing. Can you name yes. some of the players that you've met down in Venezuela <laughs> that were, just to name off, to oh, rattle off yeah. a list? I mean, it's impressive. Oh, uh, let's see. It's an all-star list. Uh, Maglio Ordonez, who is an original twin killer. He played for the White Sox and Tigers. He was a really he actually owned the local team that I used to cheer for there. So I got to meet him. He was a great guy. Uh, there's a guy named Eduardo Escobar who played for the Twins. So I got to meet him when he was a rookie and he got traded to the Twins. So I used to go to the games and talk to him and stuff. I got to know him a little bit. And then he hit it off big for the Twins. And now he plays for the Diamondbacks. Uh, a guy named Osdrubal Cabrera, who is a second baseman now for the Washington Nationals, gold glove winning all star Dude, oh man, that dude is legit. I actually took batting practice with him one night. That's a cool story. Um, you know, just things like that. Uh, the last game that I went to in Venezuela had Jose Altuve playing, Elvis Andrews, Pablo Sandoval. If you're a baseball fan, you'll know who these guys are. Uh, Wilson Ramos, um, things like that. So that, you know, those are just some of the, a lot of the stars you see in MLB are just guys you see hanging around town which was pretty cool. A lot of times in the off season, they go back down to Venezuela and play for the teams. And I remember I went to yeah. one game with you and we're sitting yeah. in the stands and we're sitting over in, I can't remember if we're probably by first base and you reach yep. over and you said, Greg, do you know who that is? And I'm from Wisconsin. I was born in Milwaukee. Right. And you're like, Greg, do you know who that is? And I'm like, I had no clue. I'm looking at the women. Right. And, Cause there's some hot women there and, and Matt, you're like, Greg, you know, that guy walking to first, you know who that is? And I'm like, no. And you told me his name. Of course, I forgot it. Sure. You said something like, yeah, Greg, he plays for the, he plays for Milwaukee. He's a brewer. And I'm like, what really? You kept pointing out different people in this game, the random game that you and I went to. And we yeah. went into the locker room afterward because you wanted ball sign for baseball sign for or glove sign for Rue. Yeah, that was yeah, amazing. Yeah. We sat around afterwards yeah. and waited with the wives. With, with the guys are coming <laughs> out, right? Yeah, they didn't have a lot of people waiting for like signatures down there. It was like they're just coming out to get a beer or to get you know see their girlfriend yeah. or pick up their wife. And we were standing right there with them as they're all coming out, and they're like, 
you're introducing yourself. That was great. And sometimes at the stadium, they used to think because I was an American, they thought I was a player. Security never bothered me. So when the game was done, I'd walk straight back to the locker room and go sit and talk to the guys and stuff like that, which I thought was cool. That's funny you remember that game. That was the Ronnie Cedeno game. That was he was a Ronnie Cedeno was a shortstop for the Mets at the time, and okay. so I got a I got a foul ball that game and had him sign it for Carew. So, yeah, that's funny you remembered that. Well, talk about experiences, Matt. I mean, then that's baseball is huge for you. It's one of those things that makes you connect back to home, and the fact that we were yeah. living in Venezuela, where a lot of MLB players go down to, and I didn't even realize that was an experience until I went with you. I really had no clue. Oh my gosh. If if anybody is ever in Venezuela or you find yourself there and you have a chance to go to a game, you have to go. Or even they have a pro basketball league too, which is a whole nother. I thought the NBA was fun. And then you go to a pro game in Venezuela and it's 10 times the experience that the NBA, the NBA could take some clues on how to build a crazy rabid fan experience because man, internationally it's if you get to attend, didn't you go to a soccer match once? The Vino Tinto? Didn't you see I went Messi to a play? Lot of, I went to a lot of Vino Tinto. <laughs> but didn't you go to that Argentinian national game where they played Messi? Yes, yes. Well, in Honduras, I would go to soccer games all the time. Regional games. And it's just like you see on the news. You know, you have the big fence between the two teams and the, the people are all going against each other. You know, the fans are here and the fans are there and they're... They're fighting. You got guys with riot gear and, you know, surrounding the field so no one goes out onto the field. It's crazy. It really is. Yeah. And those were total experiences because in in Honduras at the time, in, in San Pedro Sula is where I was. And we had one local guy who was working with us at school and he would take us to the games. And we had so much fun going there because they would have like little eight year old boys working the stands. And he knew two or three of these boys because he'd go to the games all the time. And these boys were in charge of getting us beers or getting us food or getting us a bottle of something or whatever we needed. It's different than it is in in other places where you go and you stand up and you go to stand in line and stuff like that. They had like children were just running around and they were serving. They were getting you whatever you needed during the game. And the game was (laughs) You know, the games were heated, heated games. Yeah. I mean, the passion that these these players have and the passion that the fans have, as well as Venezuela, the, the Vino Tinto games were just amazing as far as people supporting their teams. And when they played sure. against Caracas or something like that, my Caracas friends would come and stay with me for the whole weekend and we'd just all go to a game. Yeah. Uh, it goes back to our conversation about getting to know local people. That's how it really flavors up your life down there or whatever country you're oh, in, yeah. right? It, it really does, yeah. And, and, it gives, and that's what gives you a chance to connect and bond. Like, I can go to the, one of those baseball games, and I may not be able to speak great Spanish, but when there's a bad call and they hear me cussing out the umpire, they're like, oh, I like that gringo. He's one of us. Okay. And next thing you know, you're, you're getting your pass to you. Well, they realized, like you said, it surpasses culture and language and everything when they know that you're into the same game they are. Easy to go down a rabbit hole. Yeah, you know, when you talk about all these things that we've had on our list, you can just go into a rabbit hole for stories and experiences. And maybe that is part of it. And when you we talked about travel experiences, look at how we've randomly just gone off on tangents. Primary meaning for this episode was motivations to get, you know, what motivated us to go overseas and then some of the top perks that we have. And we made a nice list. We went over uh, dollars, you know, like money that we earn. Absolutely. Respect from uh, students and teachers overseas, traveling all over the world, languages that we've talked about. And you talked a lot about sports towards the end, too. And that was, I love sure. those sports stories. You're right. It's very multicultural to be into sports. And uh, we'll hit some of those other things on our list later. We can just keep talking the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we'll hit on in another episode is talking about like uh, professional development opportunities. So uh, let's look at wrapping up. And for those of you who are listening, again, if you want to hit us up, you've got questions, uh, maybe you've got an episode that you want to hear us talk or uh, more about, you can hit us up at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. And Greg, do you remember the Instagram account? Oh, I think it's ITP, isn't it? ITP something? ITP 
expats itp expat international teacher podcast expats but it's just itp expats so don't be afraid to look us up there too we sure appreciate everybody taking some time to listen to us uh, go down a wormhole of memories but uh this is always fun greg it was fantastic chatting with you as always matt the uh, family guy and i'm greg the single guy and this is international teacher podcast and we are signing off thanks again have a great day